With episode 40, we don't get any sort of opening sequence and move right into the episode's title, Old Story. With most of this episode revolving around flashbacks, I think the meaning there is pretty clear. The one thing I do want to note is the choice of words, with it being story rather than memories or anything like that. Which to me, already implies some level of unreliability. With the story, that of course comes from the fact that her memories are quite literally unreliable since there is a huge chunk with Frida just missing. With Erwin on the other hand, most of it revolves around stories and theories his father told him both in and out of class. Both of which also have mistakes of their own. Okay, I lied, because there is another interpretation I would offer up, and that is that the title may refer to humanity as a whole, as in, it's a story as old as time. Later in the episode, we'll get to San is talking about how Hanji, Levi, and their entire squad are devils, only for them to fire back saying that Pastor Nick probably thought the same thing of him. Only for San is to conclude that this is just what people do, their roles might now be over, but the cycle will begin anew. That humanity cycle of hatred and cruelty is a story as old as time. But wait, there's more. Because there is also the old story of Amir that Historia herself doesn't even realize yet. Hold that thought for now. Moving into the episode itself, we open with a brief flashback of Historia recounting some of her childhood memories. But okay, before we get to the serious analysis time, look at Sasha. Okay, that was just evil, I'm sorry. I feel really bad now. I touched on this briefly last time with the ED, but right away we have that parallel of Historia carrying the bucket exactly as Amir did. Whereas later scenes in the final season deliberately mirror Amir to contrast the different paths that they have walked. A royal and a slave started in the same place, but ended up in similar but directly opposing situations. With Amir being Fritz's war machine, while Historia brought upon some level of peace. She then talks about her mother Alma, or Alma, I don't know, saying she was a beautiful woman who constantly go off into the city wearing fancy clothes. With us now obviously knowing that she was Rod's mistress. Because this is overanalyzing, I think with this too we can draw a sort of a parallel to Emir. At the start of her story, we never get to see any family whatsoever. Right from the get-go, Emir is alone. Historia has a mother, but she resents her for reasons she doesn't even understand yet. And then we have Frida, someone who genuinely loved Historia, but up until the Crystal Catacombs, she is just not a part of her memories at all. So again, their stories largely begin in the same exact place, regardless of their blood. Both of them are completely alone in this world. And speaking of Frida, Historia says that she learned to read just because she always saw her mom reading. First off, the book Historia reads has what looks to be a mirror on it. Which connects to number two, it's not just Historia who learned to read, it was Frida who taught her. It's just that those memories are currently sealed away by the Founding Titan. So with these two things in mind, I think it's also implied that Historia possesses some information regarding the Founding Titan that she doesn't even fully realize herself yet. You know, perhaps another old story? Hey, I said the title again. The book she reads also talks about how parents always cared for their children, which again connects to those Historia Emir parallels. Historia never had loving parents, and based on what we see, neither did Emir. Someone who did have, well, at least a loving mom, is Sina, Maria, and Rose. So again, the book could be a sort of a mythological retelling of the founder Emir. We'll get to this later in the season as well, but the Krista of the books is almost certainly just Amir. The only thing we don't know is how much truth there is to that story. Is Krista just a weird manifestation of Amir, or is this just Amir's story with different names? We don't really know that. And I guess another loose parallel is that in the long run, Historia becomes just like that Krista, or just like Amir was. She becomes a loving mother. And also, the mother holding the baby may also be a reference to that image in the Season 2 OP. Or, I guess the Season 2 OP might be referencing this. I don't know, the Founding Titans got my head all mixed up. To continue with some emotional damage, Historia then says that one day she decided to hug her mom just to see what happens, which might just be the most depressing thing I've ever heard. She didn't do it out of love or anything like that, she was so alone and confused that she did it out of curiosity. Literally, just to see how she'd react. It's like the purest childish curiosity, but instead of exploring the world, she just wants to know what it feels like to hug her mom. Like, that is just depressing. And as if that already wasn't enough, she then says that after she was hit by her, she was still happy because at least she got her attention. So yeah, in terms of recontextualizing Historia and her whole bubbly persona, I think this one is just about as ruthless as you can really get. That said though, while Alma is certainly not winning any Mother of the Year awards, she very explicitly says that if she could bring herself to do it, she would have killed Astoria. A mother's undying love is a pretty consistent theme throughout. 
Everything from Aaron's mom literally forcing her mouth closed so as to not call out to them and endanger them, to Reiner's mom just watching as the rumbling titans come marching forward with the one hope of her son returning, to Amir and her daughters, and so on. So even in this extremely twisted situation, where she pretty blatantly says that she despises Astoria's mere existence, her motherly instincts still keep her from intentionally harming Astoria. So you know, to put like a positive spin on it, it's like really, really, really bad, but it's not as bad as it could be, right? As for why she hates her so much, in short, it's just fear of what she might bring. Like we already talked about last time, it's just that illegitimate children are just a powder keg waiting to go off. And considering how they'd been living thus far, it's obvious to everyone that she and Astoria were purposely hidden away with the hope that just no one finds them. It might work for a little while, but it's just that, a hope that no one ever finds out the truth. Eventually, that is of course exactly what happened, which brings us to the situation here. Also, Alma in Latin apparently means nourishing and kind, which um, yeah, I don't know how you arrived at that one, chief. Though Historia continues her story, saying a few days after Walmaria fell, Rod appeared. With the benefit of hindsight, we of course know that this wasn't out of any care for her, and most certainly wasn't just some random accident. This was after Grisha joined the Founding Titan, so now he quite literally needed her, as she had royal blood. Also, the whole, a few days after, is a very well hidden considering the importance of Maria's fall, but still pretty blatant Chekhov's gun. Practically speaking, why would Historia specify a certain time if it wasn't in any way relevant to the bigger picture? Why is she so vague about the rest of her childhood, but Rod's appearance is explicitly stated to be after while Maria fell? Well, we now know that it is to explicitly connect Grisha's actions to his appearance here. And on that note, as you'd expect, it's here where all the politics and the lore surrounding it get very, very messy, with us having multiple instances of information asymmetry that completely change how characters act. So first off, again, Frida along with everyone else in their family, with the exception of Rod, is dead. Grisha is during the Founding Titan and is nowhere to be seen. And we also know that after Grisha got the Founding Titan, he, I guess, force-fed himself to Eren, giving him both the Attack Titan and the Founding Titan. This, of course, immediately sparks problems for Rod, because he is straight up looking for a guy that no longer exists. Though it's very important to note that at this point in time, Rod hasn't told anyone that the Founding Titan has been captured. So he goes for Historia, as, again, she has royal blood, and if they do track down the Founding Titan, he would likely try to either coerce her into eating it or just force-feed it to her. Something we almost saw in Season 1 with Eren's Tribunal. On the other hand, we have the Council of Dinosaurs ruling over the walls from the shadows, and of course, we have their long arms in Kenny's squad. The thing with said dinosaurs is that to them, status is everything. The Rice family aren't just nobles, they are held up as literal gods with their family holding the Founding Titan. And because the Rice family is just so, so special, Kenny's squad was sent after Alma because, again, she was just Rod's mistress, so he was there to clean up that stain from Rice's name. This isn't yet some 300 IQ play to kill Rod or anything, it is merely a matter of optics to them. So Historia being sent off as just some random kid with a fake name is just a tiny bit of mercy on Kenny's and Rod's parts. However, to Rod, this is actually a vessel stashed away just in case they manage to find the founder. So the super TLDR. For Kenny, this is just all in a day's work. He is just quote-unquote cleaning up the rice name with no suspicions that the founding titan has been stolen or that there is a grander design at play. Whereas Rod is here with an actual purpose of keeping Historia alive. All of this is about the power structure. As long as the Council of Dinosaurs believe that the Rice family still holds the Founding Titan, they keep on vibing. If they were to find out that they have lost the Founding Titan, well, I'm going to have to splice in the surprised Pikachu, but they'd no longer consider Rod to be very useful or important. Getting rid of a fellow noble would just mean that they're one step higher up the pedestal themselves. As for the story we follow, there was the Season 1 Tribunal where they already attempted to yoink Eren just in case. And in Season 2, when he confirmed his Titan abilities and the whole Nick stuff happened, well, everything kicks into high gear and that brings us to where we are now. Eren and Astoria are both captured and for all intents and purposes, Rod's plan has succeeded. That said, there is still the Kenny angle. For simplicity's sake, we will leave his part in Rod's later plans for when we actually get there. There's a whole bunch of Yuri stuff to talk about and why he's even doing all of this, which will just complicate everything to the nth degree now. In the present day, he's obviously working hand in hand with Rod, but in this flashback, I think there's also an argument to be made that Historia reminds him of a certain other orphan. 
His title of Kenny the Ripper is an obvious nod to the real-life serial killer, Jack the Ripper, who typically went after women who worked in prostitution. And wouldn't you know it, the attack on Titan Kenny has a sister, that of course being Levi's mom, working in prostitution. So perhaps there's a slight inversion here of that real-life inspiration with Kenny deciding to spare Historia because it is largely a repeat of what happened to Levi. Plenty more on this throughout the season. As for the name of Krista Lenz that she is given, Krista could be of Greek origin, meaning she who is the anointed one. I guess just like with her mother, it's supposed to be somewhat ironic, as giving a royal a cover name to hide their royalty, but the given name is literally saying that she is a royal, well, that doesn't seem very smart. Okay, no, it's probably just a reference to the Krista, or I guess a mirror she read about in the book. And her last name, Lenz, means spring in Old German. Or, in other words, a signifier of the spring she'd bring about after the harsh winter. It's no coincidence that just about every traditional fantasy author interweaves this angle of a horrific winter being followed by the spring of pure catharsis. It's just the thing that we've evolved into over many, many generations and the scarcity of food and such during winter time. I guess the exception would be people who have only ever lived near the equator, but like broadly speaking, the winter is a signifier of like, you know, famine and stuff like that. So in Attack on Titan, the winter is the rumbling, the destruction of everything. The spring, on the other hand, is the aftermath. A sort of a blossoming of a new age, if you will. And also on a strictly personal level, I guess you could also take it to be that Krista was the winter time and Historia is the springtime. So with her too, there is a sort of a transformation in between. Though as we finally return to the present, we get another very ominous scene which I will absolutely overanalyze. Note how this is framed. Historia and Rod are both illuminated by the moonlight, with Rod telling her that she is the only one capable of saving humanity. Under the cover of darkness, there is this false promise that she is their supposed savior. In reality, we know that to Rod, she is merely a tool. In the background, however, we have several dark figures lurking in the shadows. And of course, the true monster in Eren still sleeping behind them. It's supposed to be this heart to heart between them, as don't forget, right now in the series, we really have no clue who Rod is. But especially with the MPs just lurking in the background, it just seems wrong and twisted, as if more secrets lay just out of sight. Something that we actually now know to be true in more ways than one. We have the Founding Titan Eren doing Founding Titan things in the background. And we have Rod, who's merely using Historia to get said Founding Titan. So yes, those dudes lurking in the shadows are more than just dudes. They're signifiers of a far darker secret. And speaking of overanalyzing, you ready for the most casual piece of dialogue that encompasses the entire story of Attack on Titan? Alright, let's go. Coming off of what we saw last time with Hanji baiting Sonus himself to reveal the truth, Sonus is now fuming at Ralph as he thinks he betrayed them. Something he, of course, never did. Though as Hanji drops the bombshell that he is actually the one who outed them, he just begins to have a complete breakdown, but Ralph then calls them demons. In Japanese, devils and demons are interchangeable, by the way, but let that sink in. This is a fellow Paradisian. For all intents and purposes, this is a fellow soldier and he is calling them devils. Hanji, of course, being quick-witted, fires back saying, I'm sure Nick felt the same way about you. So once again, it is all a matter of perspective. All the dark and twisted things they do while telling themselves that they are doing it for something or someone else. Everyone's a hero in their own story, and season three just rips that veil of ignorance away. Though after Hanji dunks on him a little, saying it's his pathetic wailing that makes them feel bad for him, he just casually adds, someone else will surely fill our shoes soon enough. Our roles are over, the cycle will begin anew. The world cannot be rid of cruelty so easily. So, um, like that boy stumbling up to the tree? Just like he says, humanity is and always will be humanity. And with said humanity comes a completely meaningless, never-ending and hopeless cycle of hatred. All things that are at the very, very heart of Attack on Titan. Everything from the inheritance of the Titans to this mysterious war that we don't even know spanning generations shows us that, just like Sana says, faces change, scenery changes, weapons change, but really, nothing changes because that is just what people are like. It is a bleak, hopeless, and nihilistic point of view on the world and humanity at large, but it is also undeniable. It is unsatisfying, it makes you angry, sad, and confused all at the same time. But over and over again, Sonus' perspective is proven right. So yeah, you can probably already anticipate my thoughts on the post credit scene of the final episode. 
Unfortunately, both in the world of Attack on Titan and in our own world, there are plenty of people who are just hammers in search of nails. And if you want to overanalyze a little bit more, I think there's also a discussion to be had around Sonus himself and how he might have envisioned himself as the lesser evil in the MP. So from his point of view, these words of someone else taking his shoes might rather be a almost fearful warning. For example, the shot we get of them going after Erwin's dad. He specifically didn't seem to be particularly excited about what they were doing. That's of course not to say that he is suddenly good or anything, I mean he still did very very bad things, but just that there might be someone even worse. Again, everyone's a hero in their own story. We'll of course be talking about all of this in the final season, but even now, these words are enough to shake Hanji, especially as he just begins to cry and says, good luck Hanji. It's just this ominous warning of, I've played my parts, and you know what? I'm relieved that it's done. As is often the case in Attack on Titan, everything is bad and everything is miserable. Hanji kicking the tables only for Levi to casually say, yeah, I'm pretty sure you sent the cockroach into the afterlife is mega funny goofy though. Though we then jump on over to Hanji catching everyone else up on what's going on. Most of which basically boils down to what we already know and is merely being acknowledged in universe. Ymir was a pure titan stumbling around beyond the walls, must have somehow eaten another shifter on Reiner's squad, that of course being Marcel. She received that power and became a shifter, and now Eren is likely going to be fed to someone, just like what happened with them. The missing piece in Hanji's deductions is the fact that they're not yet aware of the pure titan transformation process. So based on the information they currently possess, Hanji assumes that the government has a titan shifter hidden away, while in reality, they just plan on using Historia herself. That said though, remember the transcript Eren gave to Hanji, we never saw what it was. For all we know, there might be some future shenanigans going on and he might have included a little bit more than he knows. Though with that, just like last time, this just gives us a deadline to give the story a sense of urgency. It's no longer just a mystery, now we are deliberately racing against time to make sure that Eren isn't eaten and, as we'd see in a moment, Erwin doesn't lose his head. And with the plan laid out, they split up, with Levi's squad rolling out for Rod's estate while Hanji and Moblet go to meet with Erwin. Speaking of, we then jump on over to Erwin and Pixis, who has shown up in person to respond to Erwin's letter. Erwin closing the curtains and Pixis coming to talk in person obviously implies that they know that they are being watched and that this is something that shouldn't really be discussed in writing. Something that Erwin also very much spells out by just bluntly saying that they're going to overthrow the government. The thing with Pixis is that even as far back as Trost, he was already talking about how their current way of life is unsustainable, with him saying that it's only a matter of time before people begin to turn on each other. While the circumstances under which it happens are a bit different from what he might have envisioned, at this point in the story, we are rapidly racing toward a civil conflict. Considering we still have Reiner's squad, aka an external force trying to attack us, with a battle on two fronts, one of which is actually internal, the walls would simply collapse. So with that in mind, for Pixis and really for Eren as well, this really isn't even that big of a gamble. This is something that kind of must happen if we are to have any chance against Marley. Erwin's goal is not a power grab or restructuring of the social hierarchy, he just wants to find the truth. So while the show really frames this as some big gamble, realistically, if they don't do this, well, they just be picked off, just like Reeves. If they do this and fail, they die. So really, the only real option is to expose the truth and hope that revealing a story as the true successor would restore some level of balance and allow them to continue in their mission of learning of the truth. So yeah, even though Erwin's whole big thing are these gambles, I wouldn't really call this a gamble, I would more so describe this as a matter of survival for them. But regardless, much like with the Tribunal way back in Season 1, good old Pixis is on our side. We then jump on over to the mid cards, giving us some lore on the Intelligent Titans. This just basically solidifies the whole pure titan consumes a titan shifter theory, but obviously also sparks an entirely new mystery as to when did Eren become a titan shifter. Again, considering the shots of Grisha we had gotten before and everything surrounding that, it wasn't really that big of a stretch to assume that, yes, Eren did in fact eat his papa. As to how that happened, well, we'll find out soon. And another thing this confirms is of course that Zeke is just like the rest. A honestly surprising number of people have said that, even with the shots at the end of Season 2, they still hadn't really accepted the fact that the Beast Titan is just like the rest. So I guess this just spells that out. Returning to our elite scouts, we see Hanji and Moblitz ride by and notice Reeves' body. Again, the crowd all gathering around his body would of course be a huge deal in terms of optics, but hold that thought for now. Continuing with Eren though, he then explains the plan to crown Historia and to expose the truth about the False King to the public. 
Obviously, in a modern society, the whole succession and crown process can seem a little bit dumb, since a single person claiming to bear the name of a royal can turn the entire population upside down. Fictional stories do, of course, make it a little bit more straightforward for the sake of dramatization. I mean, no one's just going to believe you. But generally speaking, and do keep in mind I am no historian, if a claimant to the throne happens to have the church and the military behind them, I mean, at that point, it's basically GG's. We know that Historia's true identity was given to at least parts of the church, and on Erwin's side, we obviously see the military coup. So at that point, the, let's call it, definition of a king becomes very, very loose, and the crown might change heads very, very quickly. That said, it's not quite smooth sailing, as we hear that the MPs have pulled a reverse Uno and are now framing Erwin as the one responsible for Reese's death. Here we also see another cheeky bit of foreshadowing, with Erwin announcing Hanji as his successor. I think it was pretty clearly baiting us into thinking that Erwin would end up becoming a martyr in this coup, but he never does. So as soon as we've forgotten about this announcement, he actually turns out to be the sacrifice in the following mission against the monkey. Again, just ask yourself, if Erwin was never going to die, what are the chances of all this talk about succession? There is a small probability that it's just flavor text, but broadly speaking, it usually serves a purpose, and we know it did. Also, the MP dude saying that the scouts are trying to monopolize Aaron's titan power for themselves, as with almost every single good baddie in media like seriously ever, is 100% hypocritical, because, well, that's exactly what Rod and the MPs are doing at this very moment. They have captured Aaron with the hopes of regaining the founding titan that is single-handedly able to control the population of the walls. Or, you know, monopolizing its power. Though with the new commander of the scouts lined up, Aaron says he needs to be the face of the scouts and goes to face the music. The thing is, if there is anyone who thrives in chaos and a storm of information, it is Erwin. So being the big brain that he is, he is about to pull a reverse Uno on their reverse Uno. Right from the get-go, the MP tries flaunting the Charter of Humanity, something that Erwin casually recounts word for word. If you want to indulge in a bit of nostalgia for a second, this is like that moment of your teacher calling on you in class thinking that you weren't paying attention, but you are just so big brain that you can still just casually answer the question. In Erwin's case, he's obviously not a kid in class. But him still being able to recount this just levels out that presupposed power dynamic that this dude is trying to shove in his face. As we've talked about before with Marley dehumanizing Paradeep as these devils, this is basically that but on a strictly personal level. It is much easier to pick on Erwin if he can assert his dominance, but Erwin just shuts that down. Another thing Erwin does right from the get-go is acknowledge who Reeves is. Unlike many of the MPs who are almighty and really don't care for much that doesn't directly benefit them, Erwin knows the people of the Walls, so this empathetic link is just another move to frame the public as being on his side. And in a similar vein, once Erwin is being led away, he asks if he can have a moment and goes to sit by Reeves' body. Naturally, his wife is distraught and isn't sure who to trust, so she just yells out that he needs to get lost. But Erwin just calmly talks about how after Trost fell, he knew Reeves did everything in his power to rebuild. Again, this isn't some grand redemption story for Reeves. His lack of care for human life during Trost is just as bad as it was then. All of this rebuilding was still in Reeves' best interests, but again, he's not Scrooge McDuck. He's not evil for the sake of being evil. He is just a person who did everything in his power to maintain his wealth for the sake of his family. And in this situation, it just so happens that there was also a very positive externality. Whether or not he is quote-unquote bad is up to you, but it's simple self-preservation. Keep this in mind. As for Erwin, he continues with his next big scheme, explicitly stating, But now, the hand of some villain has torn that dream apart. I promise I will avenge his death. So again, currently, all of this is about optics. With words like this and his stature within the walls, you'd be very hard-pressed to think that he really was the killer. And we already see his wife also somewhat shook by his dedication. He, the supposed killer, has now made a very public appearance and promised to avenge his death. The scouts do have a mixed reputation within the walls, but at the same time, stuff like this does really make you question the truth. Though more importantly, this is also pretty blatant doublespeak, because these same exact words are true for himself and his father whose dream too was ripped apart by those same villains. And speaking of, we briefly jump back in time to hear the rest of Erwin's and Pixis's conversation. He talks about the history they were taught, saying how 100 years ago people took refuge in the walls and all records of what came before were just lost. If you were into theory crafting in the early days of Attack on Titan, you might remember how this whole 100 years thing and losing all history really didn't seem to make much sense. 
A hundred years is a long time, but also it's kinda like a couple of generations at most. I mean, surely there would at least be word of mouth and pass down stories of what came before, right? How is it that my grandpa can ramble on for two hours during family gatherings, but the history of the walls has just been Thanos snapped? Well, Erwin thought the same exact thing. The reason why it didn't make sense is because it's just not true. Erwin's father talked about how the books they were given were full of contradictions and rarely made any sense. As far as changing history books go, this is a story as old as time. Hey, I kinda said the episode's title again. Even without getting into current conflicts and the same exact thing happening again even in the modern age, the history you were taught is number one, definitely sanitized to, let's say, scoot around some of the not so great things your country has done, and number two, idealizes local history even if the truth was very bleak. Gotta pump up that patriotism, you know. Even if, and I say this with a huge if, it's not meant to be malicious, history is and always has been written by the victor and by default will never be the full truth. In the case of The Walls, it's just that that sanitization of history is, well, entirely rewriting history and not at all subtle. But he then talks about his father's theory, saying he believed that once humanity fled to The Walls, the king somehow altered their collective memories. If you think back to his confidence in the Season 1 mission and there being moles among them, this is precisely that. After Aaron appeared as a Titan, he instantly knew that his father was onto something very, very big. It confirmed every single one of his suspicions about his father being killed by the MPs. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could straight up rewrite the Season 1-3 to story to be, instead of Aaron chasing after the basement and the key, to just be Aaron trying to confirm his father's theories. Broadly speaking, it's the same story. A conflict of the past generation that the current generation doesn't even understand but for some reason has inherited it and is supposed to fight for it. Though just to jab another knife into our hearts and again echo the message of Attack on Titan, Erwin bluntly says that his father died because of human greed and his son's foolishness. Remember what Saunus said? Faces change, scenery changes, but really nothing changes? Yeah. But Erwin notes just that, saying for many of them there was likely no grand design. All they did was act in their own personal best interests. They simply cared for their gardens, their houses, their lands. Big picture-wise, same thing goes for Nick, Saunas, Reeves, Aaron, and yes, even Marley who believed that their lands and safety were threatened by the power of the Titans. Again, I'm just gonna shamelessly reuse this meme. But all the big story stuff aside, Erwin clearly blames himself, which also explains why he now keeps each and every one of his plans so, so close to the chest. No one really knew the goal of the female Titan mission, no one really knew the reason for Eren's squad's separation, and even with something as big as his father's theory, Erwin never touted it to anyone ever again. He remembers the last time he spoke of something like that, so now he doesn't want to endanger anyone. Even now, he has trust issues. And the one and only thing that drives him is to prove his father right. To prove that he died for something bigger than all of them. Though as we cut to the other scouts, we just see that the situation is quite dire. With the scouts now all being formally wanted and a part of the population actually buying into it, since, well, you know, we did kinda sorta have a titan brawl in the middle of Stoas. So, um, we are supposed to kinda be the good guys, but, um, you know, I mean, if I was there, maybe I wouldn't really like them that much either. Which, by the way, we will talk about this with Erwin's final charge as well, but from many, many perspectives, Erwin is the bad guy. He has all of these grand plans he never tells anyone about. We as the viewers do of course know that all of it is for the greater good, to protect the walls. But from an outsider's perspective, how are you supposed to trust a guy who doesn't trust you? Why would you ever believe that he is truly acting in your best interests? But okay, let's not open that kind of worms, Erwin's still the goat. And we of course also see that the MPs are just going all out, with multiple checkpoints being set up and explicit hunting squads now being sent to track them down. And as they're discussing their predicaments, Sasha picks up on someone approaching them. That of course being everyone's favorite mob cosplayer and Hitch. And on that cliffhanger, that is episode 40. Finally, a somewhat shorter video, but still a long one, but we are like neck deep into politics territory, so even the tiny scenes between Historia, Kenny, and Rod have like five layers of intent behind them. But anyway, next time we are diving right into the many twists and turns of the royal government arc and collecting our infinity stones of allies. So, I hope to see you back as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. My future memories tell me that there is a good chance we might have another overanalyzing video before the new year. But just in case I don't manage to get it done in time, happy holidays slash whatever you do or do not celebrate. 
If you're feeling extra bored over Christmas or something, there's a good chance I might be streaming over at Twitch, so feel free to give that a look. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Dylan Bayloy and Dennis B. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.